Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today our guest is Dr. Christian Nolling, who works as a Deputy Director at German Council on Foreign Relations, or DGRP. He also has the Center for Security and Defense at the DGRP. Welcome to this video podcast. Hi, Sergei. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. And my first question is regarding your report. You have published recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, an eye-opening report where you say that uh, the NATO and the West have uh, five up to ten years before we face a full-scale confrontation with Russia. Uh, what did you bring to the decision to be so strict and so straightforward in your assessment? Yeah, um, first of all, it was, a, it was meant as a curtain raiser um, because we thought all the information um, is basically available, but uh, our job was to connect the dots, basically. So to speak to people at the military, also uh, people in the intelligence services, and also go through the open sources and try to find the, the best estimate, so to say, the, the best educated guess on uh, the increasing risk of a war of Russia on, on NATO Europe. But it's also important to notice that this is not a kind of an an automatic thing that, that will happen anyway. Um, and that's important also because uh, that means that the Europeans can influence um, whether there is the a war likeliness growing or not growing. What we say in the report is that from that moment on when the major fighting in Ukraine stops, basically the Russians have the time to reconstitute their armed forces. One On the one hand, because they have started to become a war economy, so they are investing heavily in filling their production gaps, uh, and it looks like they are successful to a certain extent on that. And second, they are able to train soldiers in a quite significant number. So this is around uh, 280,000 soldiers they can train every year, even if these are not highly specialized long-term uh, soldiers. It's at least people who have learned to work and, and fight with a weapon. And all that together basically says brings us to the point to say, okay, um, it will take the Russians possibly six years to pose a military threat to NATO Europe. Um, and for NATO to counter that threat, not by a war, but by deterrence means you have to be ready just earlier. So that's why we said five years, just to give the Kremlin enough time to think whether war on NATO is a good idea or is not a good idea. Well, wow, that is extremely interesting and extremely scary, I need to add. And before we dive into your assessment and uh, before you explain what are these doors you have connected and what can we do with this thread, don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to, uh, to write your comments if you have your ideas under this video. And we are going further with Dr. Christian Nolling, who is uh, the head of Center for Security and Defense at the German Council on Foreign Relations, DGRP. So you have already uh, mentioned that uh, all you need, needed to do was to take all the data and to, co to connect the dots in one, in one pattern. What are these dots besides of what you have mentioned that Russia has capacity to train uh, almost 300,000 soldiers a year? Yeah, so the, the starting point is basically to say the, the probability or the risk of a war is basically has two ingredients. One is the ingredients of the military capacity, so to say, um, or the war fighting capacity, and on the other hand, the motivation of an actor. Um, and for the motivation part, it's pretty clear from a lot of studies that not me as a security expert, but the Russia experts basically write that we have to um, that we have to be uh, that we have to assume that um, the imperial ideas of Russia are not going to fade away any any time soon. So this is basically something where Putin and the Kremlin 
have set the course on being an imperialist and aggressive power, which is also a complete difference compared to the Soviet Union, which was the status quo power. Um, and the statements reaching back to the 1990s from Putin when he was still in St. Petersburg, a deputy, uh, are pretty clear that uh, this is about Russia is where the Russians are, uh, borders can be uh, changed if necessary, etc., etc. I guess the, the most shocking thing especially speaking here as a Western European, is uh, that uh, the Kremlin means what it says. And we have seen afterwards uh, the wars that were started on Georgia, the, um, the current ongoing attempt to integrate Belarus into the Russian Federation, etc., etc. So this is something which is, uh, for, for let's say, uh, a little bit uh, nasty for the West, which likes to talk a lot and do not so many things. Um, I think it's a, it's a clear signal that we just should expect that uh, Putin sticks to his words. That is absolutely what wondered me all the time, because when Putin said, and his ministers and his propagandists said, <clears throat> like, we will attack Ukraine, we will crush Ukraine, we see us in confrontation with the West. I do you remember this uh, famous TV show with uh, the uh, super propagandist Skabeva, who literally said uh, in November 21, just finish the Nord Stream 2, and the next day we will attack Ukraine and crush Ukraine. But nobody took it serious because uh, people believe that say, okay, uh, they cannot mean that. It's just like hot air. Do you think that now we have in the political uh, elites, uh, do we have understanding that Russia is a threat? Um, I think you still have the old East-West imbalance in there, um, which is those who are geographically closer to Russia um, are much more, uh, feel much more at risk um, than the Western Europeans do. So this is, this is quite an, an old pattern that we have seen for quite a while. Also because if you're sitting in Lisbon, then your security threats are just different. It's not that you don't have some, but they just look different. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, we can see that uh, due to the consideration as the Russians being an existential threat, the fact that Finland and Sweden joined NATO, which from my point of view is a big step, it's a huge step they are doing here, and doing that swiftly is um, a very good proof of uh, the risk that we should basically see there. And it's not only... Um, the Poles who are very vocal about the risk, so it's those who are considered, at least in, in Germany and Western Europe, as those who are being very serious but very silent, they are joining NATO is, I, I would say, a, a very good indicator how serious the risk of a Russian aggression should basically be taken in the rest of Europe. Well, but that is like strategic development of our perception of Russia. You have already mentioned in your, in your previous answers that the moment when uh, the fighting in Ukraine stops, Russia will start gaining power. And that sounds like a bit different to what many politicians in Germany, for example, say, that like a stalemate in Ukraine needs to be transformed into some sort of frozen conflict, and then there will be peace. So your assessment is different. Russia needs this, this uh, freezing uh, or like another outcome of this war to gain power. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think it's, it's not that difficult. Um, and of course, some of our politicians, especially in Germany, make this statement because I guess it's, a, it's an element, it's a large element of hope in there uh, because the, the war is, is uh, something that is taken so, how to say, uh, it poses so many dilemmas to a country and a political leadership that is not used to think in existential dimensions because our typical policy mode is we can negotiate everything and if we have a problem we can throw money at it um, and now you basically have an existential threat that doesn't uh, that doesn't consider your money as being good enough um, so th this is this is something where I mean it's I guess it's quite simple as I said the Russians have started uh, to to produce um, uh, a lot of new weapons, basically. And they also, due to that, have the capacity to repair what comes from the front lines being partly destroyed by, by the Ukrainians. Once the fighting stops, the Russians basically can redirect what they currently produce going back into their armed forces. Yes, their armed forces are significantly deprived currently and are suffering on the front lines uh, with regard to spare parts, ammunition, etc., etc. 
But once the fighting stops, it's a little bit like you can basically you have a filled pipeline uh, of military energy that you can basically re, re, um, reshape then in, with regard to its direction. And from then on, basically, the estimate, and that's, it's, it's still a modest estimate, um, it will take the Russian armed forces to reconstitute within six years. Some sources even say it's it's earlier. We, as I said, I try we, we try to to be modest and and um, and not to kind of over be over alarming here. Um, but that is pretty pretty much the um, the current assessment. Why politicians are not picking that up? I guess there's all again a difference between what the Western Europeans and the Eastern Europeans say on that. Um, it's a it's a lot of um, of belief in all these things. I can say for my country, interestingly, um, even in the coalition agreement that the, Germans, uh, the German government signed in 2021, uh, we declared that we want to listen much more carefully to our partners in Eastern Europe. Um, and one may wonder when that will start, basically, because currently Europe, Eastern Europe is shouting to us and also the Northern Europeans are shouting to us in terms of uh, what, the, what the nature um, of the beast is, and what has to be fair, Scholz, uh, our Chancellor, even acknowledged that he has an, a, a quite good idea of of what uh, uh, what the character of the threat is. But then the consequence out of that, to start countering the Russian threat, and by that preventing the next war in Europe, that is basically what is still missing here. But that is uh, exactly uh, what, like many people in Central Europe or in Ukraine, where I'm um, now, like in Kiev, uh, talk about that we need not only understanding of the threat, we need to counter it. But before we go to this topic, uh, there is a very strong argument uh, from many Western European politicians who say Russia cannot be a substantial threat to NATO or to the West <coughs> because Russia is weak. Russia mm. is aggressive, but look, Russia could not uh, take Kyiv within three days, within three months, or even within two years. Russia cannot take Zaporizhia or Kherson. They are stuck in Ukraine. What kind of threat can they pose to NATO with all the aviation and navy and all land armies? Uh, so we can just ignore these threats because the Russians would never dare to attack us as it will be a suicidal attack for them. Yeah, um, it's good that they pose the question because um, one has to to um, counter a potential misunderstanding here. It's it's not the the assessment that the Russians would militarily conquer the whole Western Europe. <clears throat> That's basically not not in the cards um, because simply the the amount of armed forces that you need for that would be just significant, uh, and even the Russians wouldn't possibly be able to do this. The trick is, is, is just an old one, because this is one of the scenarios that, that we had before the second uh, war in Ukraine that, uh, that the Russians started. It's possibly enough if the Russians can take some square, kilo, some square kilometers of NATO territory and, for example, a capital like Vilnius and say, OK, now we can start negotiating, basically. Um, and if then within the NATO countries a discussion starts whether it's worth so risking the soldiers of Germany and France and Spain to retake Vilnius, or if we shouldn't give in to that, then you basically start uh, killing NATO because the the strength of NATO is political solidarity. Only out of this strength you can gain military solidarity or military strength, basically. So this is something where if you create basically on on the European continent two areas. Uh, of NATO allies, those who are worth to be protected and those who are not worth to be protected, everybody who is in NATO basically has to question whether uh, it makes still sense to, to stay in NATO. And this will be, of course, the end of NATO. And Putin knows it because his whole lifetime he was an agent who was working with undermining uh, destruction, distortion, misinformation, and practically destroying things, but not directly with violence, <coughs> but with lies and pressure. And how much of Russian nuclear blackmailing is in is in this threat? Um, the nuclear blackmailing will always be around um, because that's also part of, of the Russian DNA. One one could basically say so. It's it's uh, as you said. I mean, a direct um, military confrontation with NATO can only have possibly limited success. Um, but as we already see, 
um, that the nuclear blackmailing has worked for some capitals, including mine, um, it will always be a part of, of the Russian threat of, of basically turning the, the traffic lights from, from green to yellow, which is just enough, you know, if people start talking. And, of course, in our societies, we need the support of the parliaments and of the people to this. And if you can threaten the people directly, um, not via military force, but saying it can happen everywhere, then, of course, this is something which spurs debate into, in, within open societies, which is, which is pretty clear. So, therefore, you can see that a, a lot of um, investment... Um, has to go not only into the military side to counter this threat uh, by, by vamping up the military deterrence, but also by increasing the, the societal resilience and the critical infrastructures. It's, some, it's a topic that is not well discussed among the militaries. To a certain extent, they know it, but it's something where they still discuss this in silos. And I guess this is one of the most important things, because currently, if you look all over Europe, especially my country is, is a good example, we have a kind of wear and wear and out, worn out our, our critical infrastructures. So even in peacetime, they don't work properly. But how can you expect that people under a, a threat of their life or a crisis basically can, can operate um, if the infrastructure doesn't operate. So there's a bigger topic that is coming up, which is not only the military dimension, it is that what especially the northern countries call total defense or civilian defense, which also needs to be part um, of the overall effort to counter a Russian threat. That is indeed, uh, in Germany, a great story. Like, uh, I don't expect that Deutsche Bahn German Railways operates perfectly even amid uh, peacetime, uh, not speaking about wartime. And uh, how can we expect that other, um, other systems of our infrastructure work properly when directly being hit by the Russian missiles or by Russian sabotage groups? But another question which I wanted to ask you <coughs> is, um, as far as I understand your concept, this Russian threat within five to ten years uh, will uh, exist independently on the fact if Russia gets some territory gains in Ukraine or even if Russia gets kicked out of Ukraine and Ukraine restores its sovereign territory because Russia will still have its wish to dominate the world and to retake the exam, so to say. Um, exactly. So we would expect that the motivation, as long as the Kremlin works as it works, so based on a, on a system of violence, um, that this is basically the DNA of, of the system. <clears throat> so without a kind of a, a different type of political system, which is a real political system, which is not only a governing system, um, we shouldn't consider that the nature of the threat basically changes. Um, and you're right, um, regardless whether the Russians would now freeze the front line or being kicked out of Ukraine, the Russians will, because of the motivation, pose a threat once they get the military capability over the certain threshold. However, this also brings Ukraine back into the game. Um, because currently, from a, that's my impression at least, from a Western European point of view, um, we donate stuff to, to Ukraine. Um, it is in our interest to make Ukraine uh, an integrated part of our defense concept, actually. So that means on the military side, but also on the industrial side, to work together with Ukraine. Because in a, in a geostrategic perspective, Ukraine, of course, poses a, a well-armed Ukraine, poses a significant threat and military dilemma to the Russians. So it's, it's not only in our interest to support Ukraine now, it's basically in our interest to keep the support up just to cause military dilemmas to the Russians uh, and by that uh, reduce the threat uh, towards Europe as a whole. But that is exactly like one step into the direction which I wanted to ask my next question. What could be practically done to uh, fight this threat? We know that um, neither Germany nor France have fulfilled our promises to uh, burst the uh, production of artillery ammunition. We cannot send enough ammunition to Ukraine now, and of course we will not be able to have enough artillery ammunition for our own needs in a case of such war like you have described. What should be done step by step to reduce this Russian threat? Yeah, I think it's, it's exactly not step by step. 
Um, it's basically, and, and one has to say, it's doable nonetheless. So um, it is pretty, in brackets, pretty easy um, to find the solution, which is really gearing up and using the uh, the rest of the production capacity that we have in Europe. European companies are already vamping up their capacity to produce, but it needs a kind of, a, I would say, positive state intervention, which is guaranteeing that we, and let's stay for the ammunition with the time, because that's the easiest and most obvious, just ensure that we will pick up every ammunition and buy every ammunition part that, that will be that will be produced because it's not only Ukraine, it's also all the Europeans that need the ammunition anyway. So there's enough demand for European ammunition producers for the next decade at least. What they need is basically the uh, on the one hand a clear signal that we will buy it and also I guess an indication that it is a priority from our side and that exporting ammunition from Europe is only okay if the support for Europe is sufficient in that. Because we still have a lot of ammunition that is produced in Europe but basically leaves Europe and that's not in our interest. So we basically, the, the governments have to have a, a bigger conversation with the companies and say, so what can we do? Also talking to the original recipients of the ammunition and say, could we basically delay your delivery so that we get it earlier? And it's, but it's, it's a great reshuffle that you basically have to do. And I am, as I said, the good thing is we can still act. It will take a little, a little bit of time. But if you talk to the producers of land warfare uh, production, then they say, yeah, it may take two years to build up new production lines. But then the scaling of the production is not the problem. Um, that's basically it. But so if this would happen, it's not only we are vamping up the military capability of NATO, it also sends a clear signal towards the Kremlin, look, guys, we are starting now. And if the trajectory is a very steep one, then this is something where you can at least give uh, the Kremlin the opportunity to consider and reconsider whether it's a great idea uh, to, to reconquer the territory they think is theirs and is currently um, uh, in, is an um, independent state and part of NATO. Um, if that doesn't happen, if we don't have a clear signal towards, uh, towards Russia, then this is basically increasing the risk. So they may, may miscalculate, even if we are too late for this, this is also increasing the risk, uh, because they may miscalculate the situation with regard to the strengths of NATO and also with regard to the strengths of the Ukraine, which is part of the, of the whole game. So it's basically, um, I guess you would have to consider Ukraine and the NATO countries as, um, as a single set of forces and a single set of capabilities with regards to the Russian threat. That's how we think it in NATO. So uh, Ukraine, whether it's part of NATO or not, um, if it is well armed and uh, we, we deliver the capabilities they need, it is de facto a part of Western defense. Indeed, and we know that the Ukrainian army is now operating mostly NATO equipment, at least what, um, like regarding artillery or tanks, and uh, fulfills like most of uh, requirements of the NATO standards. We're talking to Dr. Christian Mölling, who works as a deputy director at German Council on Foreign Relations, the GRP, and who has recently published, uh, together with his colleagues, a report on uh, not possible, but inevitable, as he says, uh, confrontation uh, between NATO and Russia, uh, where NATO can only be prepared to the confrontation and not, like, uh, not postpone it or not, like, uh, not not make it <coughs> impossible uh, within the next five to two years. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. And my next question to you is: When we talk about weapons in this war, we have seen like different changes. Uh, in um, in the uh, in, in the t in the speed of the war and in balance of powers with arrival of HIMARS artillery systems first, then with storm shadows and scalps, the Ukrainians are still awaiting uh, Taurus, which have not been green lighted yet. But the Russians already also produced their own weapons, which are some sort of superior to what Ukrainians have. For example, the Lancet drones. Um, what will be, um, according to your analysis, what will be the next weapons which Russia will try to develop within the next five years and produce, and how can we, uh, how, how can we counter <coughs> these? Yeah, 
Um, it's a little bit of guesswork, but as timelines are tight on every side, um, the Russians don't have much time to do larger developments of new quality of, of larger equipments. So I guess we'll not see a new generation of tanks. That's also important for the uh, for the for the Western support, which also means we don't have to calculate innovation in that area um, into into our uh, trajectory for developing capabilities. Drones are a very special area um, because there it's it's on the one hand its mass, so the quantities that uh, make it a a very special threat, but also the incremental innovation that is taking place. So we got from, from some sources that basically every two weeks the configuration of the drone changes um, and then also the quantity changes. So what you see is there's an, what we call incremental innovation that is taking place, uh, which improves the weapon. Um, so there's a little bit like a, um, uh, like, like a race, you, you could say, in this very specific area. Um, and the quantity matters, which basically puts the, the battlefield into a situation that um, the Americans have strived for but never, never achieved it, which is basically having a fully explored and fully transparent battlefield. That's basically where we are currently heading with regards to the drones, because they are every there 24-7. They're getting night vision uh, capacity now. Um, and that poses a significant threat simply because there are so many. The Russians are increasing the production. The Ukrainians are increasing the production. What is missing on the Ukrainian side more than on the, on the Russian side is the electronic warfare capacity to counter the drones. This is still an, an, important, an important dimension where the West traditionally has been weaker than the Russians. Uh, and it is something where also the Ukrainian chief of staff has said this is one of the key areas where they need the support and, um, and development to just field more equipment. So I guess in large, it's producing more of the same is good enough. It's not, um, you know, we don't have to fight the war of the, of the 2040s. It's the war um, today is basically possibly the war of the next decade with some improvements here and there. But its quality um, doesn't matter as much as quantity, or quantity is a quality on its own. Well, that is a very interesting perspective, like where we, what we need to do and how we need to, to fight the Russians. But you write in your report uh, about the need of security decade, or not the need of security decade, that we, do we want it or not, we are entering the security decade in, uh, in Europe. Uh, what kind of military alliances uh, are needed here? Is NATO enough or do we need like some stronger eastern flank like intermarium alliance or something like that? Um, that's a tricky question. Um, if you take a look into the enlargement of the European Union or of Europe in the different institutional frameworks, then the step was always first NATO, then the European Union. Um, there is currently a, a lot of, um, how to say, stumbling blocks to make Ukraine part of NATO and other countries which um, want, to, um, uh, want to access the European Union part of NATO. At the same time, the security guarantees for these countries have become even more important because they will, to a certain extent, be frontline countries or more in danger. Um, the, intermediate, the intermediate construction, from my point of view, is even if we can't give those countries the nuclear umbrella of NATO, uh, may, that makes it even more important to vamp up their conventional capabilities as much as possible. Um, so basically, to, you know, that may sound selfish, but I hope it's, it's rather realistic. They are the first line of defense, basically, in, in, in that regard. So in leaving that weak, basically weakens the Europeans as, as such. So I think um, it doesn't... It's not in the card currently, in the cards politically, to make Ukraine um, very swiftly a part of NATO. The European Union can't deliver the security guarantees, even if it's in the treaties. So it's more a kind of a, um, a I would possibly, let's try to, from the top of my, I call it a military project or military cooperation thingy, but very, very deep going. Um, simply because military coordination 
to make it very effective, and that's something that we have seen also in the war in Ukraine, needs cooperation on all levels. Um, so that's, that's a very important thing. If we can't get the Ukrainians into NATO, then basically the capability dimension of the cooperation needs to be the prime and, and first class, basically. Now, is there understanding of this threat in European societies? I don't talk uh, about like the Baltic states or Poland, where this understanding is clearly present, but in other European uh, economies <coughs> like Germany, France, the Netherlands, uh, we know all these uh, social services when only 14% of the Germans say that they would be ready to fight with arms in their hands for their country if their country is under a military attack by a rock state. And I'm pretty much not sure that this number would be higher if Russia attacks uh, Germany because of our experience and it's not the best idea we, you can advertise yeah. among the Germans. So how much of understanding that we need to do that and that this threat doesn't depend on what we do, the threat exists anyway? Yeah. Um, that's, that's a very good question. And honestly, I can't give you a, a straightaway answer to that. Um, so you have cited one of the figures that is out there that only 40% of the Germans are willing to kind of, uh, you know, fight on the front lines. Um, at the same time, if you take a look into the numbers of those people who still want to support Ukraine, the numbers are constantly high. Um, and they are, so there seems to be a mismatch between the public support for supporting Ukraine militarily and what the political leadership is basically doing, what the government is doing. So there's a, there's a gap which I would say needs to be filled by political leadership. So it's the job of the government to explain to the people what the options are. And you maybe recently have heard that our defense minister said that the country and especially the society has to engage with the idea that there is a threat of war, um, which is not imminent, but it is just, it is a possibility. We cannot exclude war from coming to NATO countries. And that's also what, what the NATO strategic concept says, that we cannot exclude a war from, from being a, somewhere in the, in, the, in the future being a reality for us, and we have to prepare for it. So the whole discussion about the mindset has very practical consequences if you bring the idea to the people, which anyway seem to be ready. They are considering what it, what it means, and they have an opinion on whether we sh should support the Ukrainians, despite all the discussion of where, war wariness in, in societies, which is also a factor, of course, kicking in. I think it's still something where um, we have to seize the opportunity um, as long as, as we can and, and draw on the, on the kind of awareness of the people and say, look, Let's think, let's think through what, what basically has to happen, which I would think also increases the understanding of the people of what is the burden that, you, that the Ukrainian civil society currently is carrying. So by that kind of, kind of giving analogies between how it is in a war and what is the, 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 the challenge that it basically brings to society is a different way of engaging with the Western societies in here. Well, that is a very realistic approach and uh, to what we are facing now and uh, do we want it or not, war has came to our reality and war will remain a part of our reality. So what we have to do is to increase our ability and our strength to, uh, to guard peace and to fight for peace and to strengthen peace. Thank you so much. It was uh, Dr. Christian Merling who works as a deputy director at the German Council on Foreign Relations, Dege Pe, who was our guest. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel and wait for the next interviews. Thank you so much, Dr. Merling. Thanks so much, Sergei.